Walker. Uh, it's brought to you by the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Uh, my name is Peter Hanlon. I'm the Director of Public Engagement for the Graduate School of Oceanography, which we call GSO for short. Um, first of all, thank you. It's so great to see everyone here in the building. I know it's been a big storm today. It probably took some doing to get here safely and on time. So thank you for being here. And also thank you to all the folks who are here online watching on YouTube and Facebook. I know we have a global audience tonight, which is really, really exciting. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, so I just want to mention before we start uh, this evening that 2021 is actually a really big year uh, for the Graduate School of Oceanography. This is our 60th anniversary. Um, we've been around since 1961. And since then, we have over 1,000 graduates. Um, so folks around the world doing incredible work. So with them, with all the faculty, with all the staff over the years, with our current students, really building this incredible legacy of ocean exploration, discovery, research, um, that uh, continues to grow today. Um, so one of those, or actually two of those alums are right here and you'll hear from <laughs> Dr. Ballard very soon. Um, so none of this happens though without uh, Drs. Charles and Marie Fish. Um, so back in 1936, uh, Charlie Fish, as he was known, uh, was tasked with establishing the Narragansett Marine Lab down on what we now call the Narragansett Bay Campus. And he and his wife, Marie Fish, did exactly that, created a flourishing lab. Um, and Marie Fish, in fact, became really a pioneer in women, for women in uh, marine science. Um, so really, we're so indebted to their work, to their vision, to their dedication, um, and to their support today as well. So a, a big thank you to that family. Um, so one little bit of info I wanted to share is afterwards we will have a little bit of time for Q&A um, and f obviously for folks here, feel free to raise your hand. Um, but for those who are watching online on YouTube or Facebook, please leave some questions in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can um, over the course of that. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce one more GSO alum, uh, our Dean, Dr. Paula Bontepi. Thank you, Peter. So welcome, everybody. I'm so glad we could do this. Um, last year was the start of my first year as dean, and we had to do everything remotely. So I'm really pleased that we can do this safely and in person, at least partially. And welcome, everybody, online. So I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Robert D. Ballard. He's a professor of oceanography at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography, where he earned his PhD and founder and president of the Ocean Exploration Trust. He is an explorer at large at the National Geographic Society, commissioner for the US Commission on Ocean Policy, and a research scholar at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Dr. Ballard served in the US Navy for more than 30 years and continues to work with the Office of Naval Research. A pioneer in the development of deep sea submersibles and remotely operated vehicle systems, he has taken part in more than 155 deep sea expeditions. In 1985, he discovered the RMS Titanic and has succeeded in tracking down numerous other significant shipwrecks, including the German battleship Bismarck, the lost fleet of Guadalcanal, the US aircraft carrier Yorktown, and John F. Kennedy's boat PT-109. Dr. Ballard has also discovered hydrothermal vents and, quote, black smokers in the Galapagos Rift in East Pacific Rise in 1977 and 1979, which is actually the first time I heard his name. The author of numerous books, scientific papers, and articles, he has been featured in several National Geographic television programs, including Secrets of the Titanic, a five-part miniseries, Alien Deep with Bob Ballard, and in 2019, Expedition Amelia. He was a special advisor to Steven Spielberg on the futuristic television show, Sequest, sorry, Sequest DSV, which I actually remember watching when I was younger. His honors include 22 honorary doctorates, National Geographic's highest award, the Hubbard Medal, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Medal. He was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2014. Dr. Ballard's autobiography, Into the Deep, was released this year and National Geographic aired a television special, Bob Ballard and Explorer's Life in June. Now, what I'm supposed to say next is it's my great pleasure to introduce him, which it is, but I wanna just tell you one quick story about Bob that you don't know. Sorry, Bob. So last year when my family moved here, the kids had a really hard time in school. Our son is in middle school, pivoting to sort of full remote learning, like I can assume many of you did and many of your children did. And I mentioned to Bob one day in passing in the hallway that uh, my son was a big fan 
And, um, you know, he was having a hard time adjusting. We had just moved across country. He hadn't seen his friends to say goodbye. He was in a new school. And things were a little bit of a challenge. And Bob said, you want me to come and give a lecture to his school? And I was like, is he serious? So I, I called the teacher and I told the teacher and she said, absolutely. Well, the whole school turned out for the lecture. And I just want to say one thing um, that I thought was really incredible about Bob. The first thing out of his mouth at that lecture was about what it's like to be dyslexic. And there were three kids in the class that happened to be dyslexic. And the teacher was also dyslexic. And none of them ever talked about it. But within one minute, he told about his experiences and how it never stopped him from achieving all the things he did. And the teacher called me later to say, no one had ever done that for those kids, which is take something that people try to hide away or look at as a deficiency and make it something that didn't hold them back from anything they wanted to dream or accomplish. And if you knew nothing else about Bob, that was the one story that I always tell, which is the kind of person he is. So it is my great pleasure to introduce this year's Charles and Marie Fish lecture speaker, Dr. Robert Ballard. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Well, so nice to be here. I, I've taken off my mask. I just tested negative yesterday. I've had all three shots and the flu shot, and there isn't a vaccine I don't like. You know, I, <laughs> Um, make sure you get the, uh, every vaccine you can get. Now, what Paula left out, which is my opening line, is the fact that I was born here, about as far from the ocean as you can get in Wichita, Kansas, where all oceanographers come from. <laughs> uh, but I was born six months after Pearl Harbor, and my, my father was making bombers in Wichita at the time loaded the family in the car, and I woke up in the Mojave Desert. Uh, I mean, what a transition from the cornfields of, of Kansas to the Mojave Desert. And he was one of the right, he was flying with Chuck Yeager. He was a test flight engineer. And, and then after the war, we moved to San Diego. And uh, naturally, parents are parents, and they always ask you what you want to be. Well, I was 12 when they asked me that question. And I had just seen, because I'm dyslexic, I tend to favor seeing things like movies. I had just seen 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Who is here tonight with that magical book? He's, we've got two 20,000 Leagues. I saw someone hand, you, you have the book, right? Well, I have to read it someday, but I watched the movie. <laughs> and, and naturally, uh, when my parents asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I told them I wanted to be Captain Nemo. And they didn't laugh at my dream. You should never laugh at a child's passion, no matter how wacky it is. So they worked with me on it. And they said, well, tell me more about Captain Nemo. I had a submarine named the Nautilus. Took me down to San... I was living in San Diego at the time. We went down to Ballast Point, and we went aboard a diesel submarine back then. And I fell in love with submarines, as you'll see in a minute. I went into the Navy, served for 30 years in deep diving submarines and submarines. But then they said, what the Nautilus was more than a submarine. I said, it had a big window that you could look out of. And they said, well, that sounds like an oceanographer. Lo and behold, right up the street from me was Scripps. And they took me there. And as you can see, I went on to become an oceanographer. So never underestimated the passion of a child's dream. Keep pouring fuel on it. So here I am when I first arrived at the University of Rhode Island <laughs> in my little white uniform. I must say, uh, I, I quickly uh, got a nickname by some of my colleagues uh, that called me the White Tornado because not only am I dyslexic, I'm ADHD, but I learned how to harness my energy. So I was assigned by the Office of Naval Research to oversee all of the ONR contracts in the New England area and naturally the University of Rhode Island. So I came to the University of Rhode Island campus in March of 1967. So that's how my journey on the East Coast began. Okay, let's see. Uh, I went backwards. There we go. I was lucky, and, and you will discover through the course of my presentation, I'm one lucky kid. I've, luck seems to be uh, well, my companion, and I hope it never goes away. I happened to be, uh, uh, at, when I came to the University of Rhode Island, which I'll talk about in a second, 
I, I majored in marine geology, but the geological sciences was undergoing an amazing revolution in the 60s. And it began for me when Bruce Hees and Marie Tharp published this map, and it's really a cartoon more than anything, showing the ocean floor. And I always love that, ocean floor. This is the largest mountain ranges on Earth or beneath the oceans. I always find it funny you call it the ocean floor. But what you'll quickly see is running around the Earth like on a seam on a baseball is a giant mountain range. The single largest feature on Earth is beneath the sea. If this were, this is on a Mercator projection where you take a sheet of paper and wrap it around a globe and project, and it tends to distort everything. Greenland is not that big, Antarctic is not that big, but it's pretty accurate right about here. But if you were to put it on an equal area projection, you'd see that the mid-ocean ridge covers 23% of the Earth's total surface area. Think about that. Almost a quarter of our planet is a mountain range, and we did not send human beings into that mountain range till after we sent astronauts to the moon. Think about that. We sent astronauts to the moon. They played golf up there uh, before we were exploring the largest feature of our own planet. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this, and I'm going to superimpose upon this uh, map of the Earth all of the major earthquakes over Richter 5, which is a scale that's exponential, uh, Richter 5 earthquakes over the last 20 years, and look what you see. They're not randomly scattered. The Earth is telling you something. The Earth is telling you that it's, A, alive, but it's very organized in its behavior because what it's doing is outlining pieces to the planet, pieces to the planet. We now call those pieces plates, the reason we call them a plate, because a plate is pretty thin, but big in the X and Y. So these are, the, this is the behavior of the Earth. See, I think of the Earth as a living creature. It's called the concept of Gaia, which I'm a strong advocate of, that the Earth is a creature living symbiotically, hopefully, with life on our planet and codependent upon one another, except for one species that's off the reservation, and you're looking at us. We're off the reservation. In a balanced system, we are living symbiotically with the planet. But the planet has three kinds of behaviors. When you cut yourself, for example, a warm blood comes out of your body. It coagulates and forms new tissue. If you cut the earth open, where you, along this mountain range is where the earth is being pulled apart by these plates. So it's cutting open its skin. It bleeds its molten blood from the asthenosphere, rises up from the asthenosphere, hardens and forms new tissue. This is how the Earth creates its outer skin. Now, since the Earth isn't getting any bigger or smaller, it's in steady state. If you create crust here, you consume it where they're in collision. So here the Earths are colliding, the oceanic crust being heavy, heavier than the continental crust, always loses the battle and goes back inside the planet. But the continental rock buckles and forms great mountain ranges. All the great mountain ranges of our planet were caused by the collision of plates, and it's been going on for billions of years. The third kind of behavior is where it's neither separating nor colliding, but moving past one another, the classic example being the San Andreas Fault. Uh, Los Angeles sits on the Pacific plate. San Francisco sits on the North American plate, and they, they're moving towards one another. It's going to be a long time before the Dodger Giant games across town rivalry, <laughs> but Think about it, it's, it's moving your height in your lifetime towards one another. It's growing, it's moving as fast as your fingernails grow. So it's, when you add it up over a few million years, it adds up to a lot. So those are the three kinds of behaviors, but this is the one I really like. I call this the bleeding earth. This tells you the age of the ocean floor through time. Now you're saying 280 million years, I thought the earth's four and a half billion, it is. But remember what I mentioned. All the oceanic crust constantly goes back inside the Earth, but the oldest actually being in the Mediterranean. There used to be a giant ocean, a massive ocean stretched all the way from Spain to the Philippines called the Tethys. But all of these colliding plates have closed the Tethys. But, so it's, it's only now 280 million are just about to disappear. You'll also notice that the bands are different in width because the Earth along the spreading center is bleeding at different rates. In the Atlantic, where you have continents sitting on the backs of the plates, they're moving about two and a half centimeters a year away from one another. 
in the Pacific, the Pacific plate is a third of the Earth. It's trucking at about 10 centimeters per year. So it's really moving. So there's a tremendous amount of energy coming out. But what we were charged to do in 1973 and 1974 by the National Academy was to go out and test the theory because no one had ever gone down to the boundary of creation and actually witnessed the process. We picked two sites, one in the slow spreading area and one in the fast spreading area. The first one we went to, we called it Project Famous. But just before we went, I was finishing up my PhD at the Graduate School of Oceanography on the early opening. So I was right in the battlefield of plate tectonics at the time, at the creation of the Atlantic Ocean, which continues to grow to this day. So we went out, and this was my way to get to work. And I'll be talking to you a lot about how I get to work. But this was Alvin, based at Woods Hole. So I, after I uh, left, the, uh, got my PhD, I was, uh, went to Woods Hole, spent 30 years there in the deep submergence program, beginning with physically going to the bottom of the ocean. Because that was the only way to get the Mark I eyeball down there. And we did that uh, in 1973, 1974. So upon completing my PhD, I was still completing it actually, we went out to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge to go down into that crack caused by the North American plate moving that way and the Af North, uh, 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 Eurasian plate moving that way. Here is where the blood is coming out coagulating, forming new tissue along the entire mountain range. Think about it. There's 40,000 nautical miles of this mountain range, and all along, all 40,000 miles are active volcanoes. Talk about energy source. We're, very few countries are harvesting that energy. Iceland can't help it. They live on top of it. But think about the massive amount of energy that the Earth is generating, and we've yet to tap into it. We will someday, I'm sure. But then we wanted to go to a faster spreading uh, center, and we went to a place called the Galapagos Rift. So this is Central America, this is Panama, Panama Canal. And we went out to this particular segment, which was spreading very fast. And we suspected that it was, there's so much energy was coming out that it would actually have hot springs. So we wanted to go down and see if we could find hot springs along that mountain range. And what we found was quite to our surprise. We found this exotic ecosystem crazy creatures, worms, 13 feet tall, sticking out their lung. That's their lung they're sticking out. Then we had clams a foot long with human-like blood. Now, we all love clams on a half shell. Do not eat one of these puppies. <laughs> First place, I guarantee you won't get past the smell. It's horrible hydrogen sulfide rotten egg smell. And when you dissect the, the clam, it does not have the internal organs of a clam. Figure that out. Its organs are all gone. It gave them up in a symbiotic relationship with a bacterium, an archaean bacteria we didn't even know about. This archaean bacteria had a conversation with the giant worms, had a conversation with the clams and mussels, says, here's the deal. Let me live inside your body because I don't like living in a hot spring blasting out of the bottom. I need a place to live, and I will feed you better than you can feed yourself. We had been taught that all life on our planet was due to photosynthesis, that the energy of the sun, the photons coming off the reactor of the sun, travel through the speed of light into our atmosphere, captured by the chlorophyll, and they fix carbon. And that's what we've been told, and that's the food chain. Up we go. We did not know there was a totally separate system operating on our planet that was not dependent upon the energy of the sun, but living off those magma chambers, and in particular living off a poisonous gas they were putting out called hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide kills you in a minute, and it's not a good death. It kills all life if you put it in a room with hydrogen sulfide. But these bacterium had convinced these creatures, don't worry, just give it to me, and I'll take it from here. And they were able to fix carbon and create an independent food chain in the absence of sunlight. So in plate tectonics, we threw away the geology book. Now we're throwing away the biology book just a few years later. And then we threw the third book away. Excuse me. Yeah, we threw the third book away when we were able to discover this whole uh, chemosynthetic system. But 
what this really told us. See, we had been told that we were lucky. We lived in the Goldilocks zone of our solar system, not too close to the sun, not too far away. Aren't we lucky? And how rare we are. This threw, the, threw that out the books. This fundamentally said the, that there's high probability of life. Oops. We're not alone. We're not alone in the universe. There, I am convinced, the academic community is convinced, that there is life pervasively throughout the universe. It's a pretty big place. And highly intelligent life must exist. But we're bound by the laws of physics. The laws of physics say as you approach the speed of light, you reach infinite mass, and that doesn't really work well with your heart. So we are trapped. Our bodies are trapped within our own solar system. So it's nice to know there's intelligent life out there. Wave it once in a while. By the way, the wave will take a million years to get to them to wave back. We're, we're on planet Earth, and there's no plan B to the human race. We're on a small little blue marble in a black velvet joint of nothingness, and if we blow it, we're gone. So, but there is a high probability that we will find life within our own solar system. Because there's two uh, planets out there, Jupiter and, and Saturn, that are, have their own little mini solar systems. We call them moons in particular. But look at this map. This is the volume of Earth shown to scale of Earth. This is how much water, if you poured it all in a ball, that's how much all that ocean would come to because our deepest ocean is only seven miles down. Average depth is 4,000 meters, 12,000 feet. But on Europa and Enceladus, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, they have massively larger oceans. In the case of Europa, 60 miles. And also have the same kind of volcanic activity, not caused by seafloor spreading, but just by the distortional forces of Jupiter and Europa in an elliptical orbit. They're constantly stressing it, causing volcanism. So. I hope NASA goes out there and finds that bacteria as fast as humanly possible. We find like, now can we get back to planet Earth? Because that's the one we need to worry about. Okay, so we threw out the, the biology book, but now we're gonna, oops, excuse me, now we're gonna throw out the chemistry book. Because we discovered on the real, uh, on the mid-ocean ridge, we also came across these crazy creatures. We called them black smokers just because they looked like Pittsburgh in the old days or something. <laughs> They've cleaned their act. This is not being, he, you need to edit that on the recording. He's recording. I, I like Pittsburgh. But anyway, what we're looking here, I remember the first time we saw a black smoker, I told the pilot, let's go over and see how hot it was. And he said, I'd rather not. And I said, well, no, let's go. We were able to convince him to go over, and we got really close. <laughs> and the fluid coming out was crystal clear. Crystal clear fluid. But as soon as it hit, Four degrees centigrade. It was the depth at those temperature at those depths. It precipitated, and what you're looking at is not smoke, but microcrystals. We call them polymetallic sulfides, pyrite, chalcopyrite, and hydrite, sphalerite, better known as copper, lead, silver, zinc, and gold, in commercial concentrations. This is commercial grade ore being created, and it's being created along that entire 40,000 mile mountain range and all the ocean that it was, all was there. So the entire ocean floor is full of massive amounts of ores, which has now opened up Pandora's box. But more importantly, at the time, um, I had a double major in, in undergraduate school in geology and chemistry, and in chemistry, we couldn't do what's called the mass balance calculations. We couldn't explain the chemistry of the world's oceans. It had a chemistry we knew very well. We were led to believe it was caused by the rivers coming in, but the chemistry of the rivers coming in was totally different than the chemistry of the ocean. Something funny was happening. And what we realized when we go back to, let's go back to the mid-ocean ridge, no sooner do you create new crust, you rip it open, and you form deep fissures. 40,000 miles of deep cracks going down to the magma chamber about 1,000 meters down before it triggers the next eruption. So you've got cracks by the zillions that are a kilometer deep, water's going down, interacting with the magma chamber. That's what you're getting in these black smokers, is the interaction. And when you take that circulation system into account, 
we realize that the entire volume of the world's oceans is going inside the planet and out every six to eight million years. We're circulating inside the planet, our chemistry. And we balanced all the equations and again, threw away. That was a pretty good run. In three years, we threw away the, ge 10 years, we threw away the geology book, the biology book, and the chemistry book. Because as we all know, science is a, is a work in, in, in action. It's still constantly learning and learning and learning. So, what are we going to do about this discovery? This is a pretty serious discussion that's ongoing right now. Do we begin mining the ocean floor for its minerals, and what will that mining do to the ocean and to the life within the ocean? It could be a catastrophic thing if we do it wrong. And we actually have some graduate students working on trying to understand where these deposits, particularly rare earths, which are critical to all of our industry and all of our, every piece of technology has rare earth in it, and by definition it's rare, and China has a lock on it, 98% of the rare earths. But we found them in our own waters, and the question is, what do we do about it? So this is quite, I've always wanted, I got the president here right now, I always wanted to have a group hire where I had biologists on one end of the discussion, geologists on the other, and the marine policy right in the middle refereeing to understand, can we do this? Is it possible to do this wisely? And that, the jury is still out. But here I am, 20 years, going in an elevator. Uh, I, my deepest dive ever made was at 20,000 feet. It took me six and a half hours to get to work in the morning and six and a half hours to get home in a 12 and a half, 13 hour commute to work. How much do you think I got done in a 20, minutes on the bottom of the ocean when I went to 20,000 feet? So I said, this is not gonna work for me after, it took me 20 years to figure that out, but anyway. I went on sabbatical, I went off to Stanford teaching geophysics there, and Silicon Valley was heating up. It was 1979. Things were cooking in Silicon Valley. Microprocessing, digital imagery, uh, uh, all sorts of new technologies. I should have thought, you know, I can make a cell phone, but I, I didn't think that. So I came back and I published this, think about this, 30 years ago, I published this cartoon. 30 years ago saying this is the future. It's taking me 30 years to get there. I'm a long distance runner, not a sprinter. But the idea was to not move my body. If you freeze frame the human race at this very second, 95% of all humans are standing on less than 10% of the earth at this moment. Think that again. 95% of all humans are standing on less than 10% of the planet at this second. Why? 72% is the ocean. Not much standing going on there. 40% of the 28 is uninhabitable. Polar regions, desert regions, and we're making more deserts now. So our human body does not belong on the bottom of the ocean. So this is about having an out-of-body experience. Literally beam me down, Scotty, is what we're doing. So this was my cartoon. I came back to Woods Hole. We have a joint program with MIT at the time, and I took my engineers, have created the Deep Submergence Lab, and said, take this cartoon and turn it into a reality. And again, being dyslexic, my mind just explodes in this direction. And my engineers said, you're nuts. And I said, tell me the laws of physics I broke. And they went, well, we do have that's classified top secret. Yeah, but I'm a naval officer. I know all about it. It's called multi-beam mapping system at the time. It was classified. All of this technology I knew existed. It just hadn't been put together into a design. So we did. But I needed someone to pay for it. Always a problem. <laughs> so I went to the National Science Foundation with my proposal, and the National Science Foundation has turned me down on every paradigm I've proposed. They've turned me down on Alvin. They turned me down on remotely. Always 15 years back. It takes them forever to take the risk. They don't take risks. But being a naval officer, I put on my uniform. I went to the Pentagon, and I said, what do you think? And they said, removing humans from the battlefield. Cool. Let's do it. And I said, well, so you'll fund it? And they said, yeah, we'll fund it. What do you want to do? Well, I thought it'd be cool to sh go out to the world and find the Titanic. They said, we're not interested in finding the Titanic, Commander Ballard. And I said, yes, but 
what if we tell the Russians I'm going after the Titanic? What do you want me to do? Now, this used to be top secret. I'm going to tell you now. It's been declassified. I don't have to kill anybody. <laughs> I'm going to tell you the tale of two stories. That's what I wanted to do. That's what the US Navy wanted me to do. We had lost two submarines during the Cold War, the Thresher and the Scorpion. And in the case of the Scorpion, it was had nuclear weapons, and we don't like leaving them around. So that was my commanding officer, Admiral Ron, Vice Admiral Ron Thumman, he was head of all submarine forces, op 2 said, Commander Ballard, I want you to go out and find those weapons. I want you to find these reactors. I want to know what they're doing, and I want to see if the Russians have been there, because we have ways of knowing if they've been there. Yes, sir. How about we use the Titanic as a cover? It happens to be between them. I wouldn't be standing here were it not for the fact that those two submarines are on either side of the Titanic. He said no, but then another gentleman with a higher pay grade named President Ronald Reagan said yes. <laughs> and through Secretary of Navy John Lehman said go do it. And we actually, John Lehman and I had a secret society called the Secret Society for Rearranging the Deck Furniture of the Titanic. <laughs> but anyway. We all know the story. It hit an iceberg and it sank. And what I learned from mapping the Thresher and the Scorpion taught me how to find the Titanic, which I couldn't say at the time, because I couldn't say, well, how'd you come up with this crazy idea of going visually? Again, being dyslexic, you tend to prefer visual. So I proposed to go find the Titanic visually. And everyone says, you can't see but 30 feet. You've got to do it like everyone else with sonars. They said, no, I have an idea. Well, I got the idea when I mapped these two submarines and found that when they imploded catastrophically and they began falling to the ocean floor, they laid out a trail of debris in the current that went over a mile, mile and a half long. It was a debris field. And I said, why don't I? The Titanic did the same thing. Let's go after the debris field because we knew it busted up. And I picked up the debris field, walked in, found the Titanic. It was a piece of cake. Well, this sort of got me interested, because it was the first ship I'd ever found in the ocean. And it started with the Titanic, which wasn't bad. But anyway, <laughs> uh, National Geographic liked it a lot. It was number one in the history of cable television, because back then there was very few channels. We had a 33 share. That meant that night, 33% of the American people watched that show. It's never been broken. 33 share. And they said, can we go for another one of those? And so we, you know, I went back with the Titanic and did the filming. But then we made the show. We went on to find the Bismarck. Unbelievable state of preservation. That scary swastika is still there. Went on to find PT President Kennedy's PT-109. Then I went off to do Guadalcanal and Midway and a whole series of programs. But naturally, being a scientist, you're always asking the next question, well, what about the ancient mariner? If you go to the website, you'll say the United Nations estimates there are 3 million shipwrecks, mostly ancient, because they've been around for thousands and thousands of years, and they have about a 10% mortality rate. So you add up a few millenniums, you get a, a fair number of ships. So I said, well, why don't we go after the ancient mariner? So I said, let's go where they are. So I went in the Mediterranean. Now, again, I, I wander into sciences and I get into trouble. I wandered into biology and I wander into chemistry. And there's the guardians of the difference, I call them. They have, well, you, you're not qualified. And I said, I'm just, my daughter, who's dyslexic, has on her desk, all those that wander are not lost. <laughs> and I'm a wanderer and I wander into things and make a tick off a lot of people. So I'm going to wander into the world of marine archaeology. So I go and George Bass, the godfather of marine archaeology, Texas A&M. So, George, how you doing, fellow National Geographic explorer? I'm thinking of wandering into your world. What do you want? Well, I, I have a question for you. Where does, do you find the ancient mariner's ships? Well, we find them right along the coastline. And I said, well, George, where are you looking for them? Well, we're scuba. We're looking right along the coastline. I said, isn't that a self-fulfilling prophet? I don't believe they would do that. If you're an ancient mariner, let's start with Carthage battling Rome, Hannibal and the, the elephants are at the gate. When they vanquished the Carthaginians, 
and the Punic Wars off, off Tropani, Sicily, it became a vassal state to Rome, particularly during the Roman Republic. It was providing all the bread and the food riots in Rome and wine. So let's start with two things. If you're a businessman or a woman and you've got to get the wine and the goods to Rome, are you going to go this way? No, you're going to go poof. I did my most sophisticated analysis. I drew a straight line between Carthage and Ostia, the seaport of Rome, and I said, they're on that one. Then I made the second guess, and I'll ask you a question. If you were on a ship with 3,000 bottles of wine on it, what would you do on the four-day passage? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. That. <laughs> so you did exactly what you supposed to. And what would you do with the evidence? Chuck it. You know what the rate of sedimentation in the Tyrrhenian Sea is? A centimeter per millennium. You can't hide the evidence. So imagine I-95 without an Adopt-a-Highway program for two millenniums. <laughs> that was my logic. It's, I'm from Kansas, remember, just common sense. So I said, I'll bet you that there's a highway of Roman empties all the way from Carthage to Rome, and I'm going to go out and look for the empties. And so I started in Gagliari, I started on land, I drove to Tropani, and I started looking for Roman empties. For 16 miles, I saw nothing, so I got a little nervous, but then I'm kind of right, but then boom, Narvana. I found the highway, four kilometers wide. That's pretty good navigation. And they, they drank all the way to Rome, and they doubled up near Rome. I got to tell you, there's more bottles up here than down here. <laughs> and that gave me the highway. I went along the highway, found the 16 wheelers that broke down, and bingo. You'll also notice that there's no wood. That's because there's a, there's a critter out there. We've been sending trees out into the ocean for hundreds of millions of years. They get waterlogged, they fall down, and Mother Nature took a mollusk, literally, and said, you're going to eat wood. And it became the shipworm, the, the Torito shipworm. So any time a wooden ship falls, there's someone there to eat it. And they eat it rather rapidly down to the mud line. But I then heard about a magical place called the Black Sea. So I was finding trade routes all along here. Piece of cake once you figure it out. But then in the Black Sea is a very interesting body of water. So here we are, the Black Sea. Go up through the, through the Dardanelles, through the Sea of Marmara, and enter the Black Sea. It's a big closed basin, but it has access to the ocean. And in that body of water is the largest reservoir of dissolved hydrogen sulfide in solution, which means nothing can live. And I went, let's go there. And here is some of the ships we found. Look at this amphora. See that beeswax dripping from the seal? It's been underwater two and a half millenniums, and nothing has attached to it. Look at the carpenter's ad mark on this piece of wood. And look at this, 350 BC ship with the human remains and all their DNA. And there's three million chapters of history waiting to be discovered. Some we know about and many we know nothing about. Okay, so what are you doing for me lately? So in 2004, I decided to come back home to Rhode Island. Sat down with President Carruthers and said, I'd love to come and I have a vision of what I want to do in teleoperated exploration. What does that mean? It means I have robots, I have a ship, ultimately no one's on any of them, and I go through the satellite down to the Inner Space Center. And I want to thank, our, how many of you are citizens of Rhode Island? I want to thank you so much for signing our bond issue to build the Inner Space Center. I think we won by, in a landslide of 16 votes or something. It was a landslide. But in politics, it's binary. It's yes or no. I want to thank you if you voted for the Inner Space Center because it was pivotal to implementing this concept of teleoperated robotics. So the idea I presented uh, was to have a telecommunication hub. Where's Dwight Coleman, the director of it, right there? And at the same time, a few years later, I acquired my own ship, which I had, for 30 odd years, stood in a mirror and said, never own a ship. It's a hole in the ocean you'll pour money into. 
I can document that that's right. I have put $20 million so far into that ship. But the idea was to, excuse me, was to have a ship run by the inmates. That's the key. We have explorers and no one above us. So we, we, it's literally a program I think is unique in the world where it's run by the explorers, by the inmates. It's interesting how you do it. I could do a whole class in economics on it. How the heck did I pull that off? But I did. But the idea was you have a ship boldly going. I love that. <laughs> boldly going where no one has gone before on planet Earth and reacting to what happens. It's, it's sort of like running an emergency room in a hospital. You have no idea when that ambulance shows up Sunday morning at 2 a.m. It turns out that Sunday morning at 2 a.m. is when I seem to discover everything. Sunday morning, 2 a.m. So the ambulance pulls into the hospital. You open up, surprise, who's in there? Mother having a baby, auto accident, heart attack. How does a hospital to deal with that level of uncertainty? They have people to do the immediate triage. So I learned there, when I was in, Ar in the Army before the Navy in Vietnam, if you can get them off the battlefield in 20 minutes, you can save them. If you can get them in there and get that triage, and then, then you call in your experts. So the way it works is exactly that. We, we have a team out there. Their job is to make the discovery and then pass it on. So here's, I'll walk you through how we do it. So anyway, here's our vehicle carrying our spirit. We put it down, we don't bring it up. Remember the yo-yo? We don't yo-yo. We put it down and we leave it down. Now we're 24 hours a day, not minutes, but 24 hours a day, staying down for days at end. You can follow it, nautoslive.org. I'll be on it from December, I'm going to Pearl Harbor on the 50th, 80th anniversary. Can you imagine that? On December 7th, I'll be going aboard the Nautilus. We'll be out for a month. Check in with us. I'll show you how. There's our command center that's running the vehicle system, three on, uh, uh, three entire watches, four on, eight off. So we run just like the Navy, around the clock, 24-7. Put it on the satellite down here. This is at the Interspace Center down at the graduate school, and then out on Internet 2 Level 3, the new Internet. And when you guys start getting the bandwidth we're playing with, we were fundamentally unaffected by COVID because we were, you were home. We came to your house. We can get into your house. We can literally, when you're a doctor on call, the way it works, you volunteer in biology, geology, archaeology, whatever. There's only one discovery. I've said, you only call me. What do you think of this? It's a UFO. <laughs> if we if find a UFO, I will never have to talk about the Titanic ever again. <laughs> That's my goal. Okay. But so, imagine you're a geologist and you're in bed and the phone rings Sunday morning 2 a.m. You wake up, you boot up your laptop, and we'll stream you the discovery coming off the bottom live. One-way video, we promise. Only one-way video. And then you make a decision. Get out of bed or not get out of bed. But that's the way it works. So what we do is here we are, boom, boom, boom. There, here, and then wherever you are. If you're in bed, you have to, and on call, you have to be within 20 minutes of what we call a remote console. And they're now less than a car. And you're going to have them in your houses anyway as we move more to electronic travel where you rent a robot that's... Uh, same as your body. I mean, not a, a, it looks like you. We are now building robots that are like humans. And you're going to rent them. And you're going to walk around the Serengeti and you're going to get a phone bill. And you can go there and back home. We have these vacations called weekends or in the evening or whatever. You're going to be able to travel from your home. I, and me, when I was a kid, we had the den. I don't know if any of you old enough to remember the den. When we first got TVs, we had to have it dark and all that. The den is back. And we're going to have, you're going to have a teleporting place in your home, and you're going to build your home where you want it to be. And you're going to move your spirit. It's cool. Now, most recently, what are we doing now now? Well, we had an interesting advertisement placed by NOAA in uh, 2019, 2018, 19, saying they wanted to award an institution, a degree-granting institution, 
a major grant to explore the America beneath the sea. So first, it was to explore the three billion acres of submerged U.S. territory, three billion acres of territory we own, and we have better maps of Mars than half the United States of America, okay? Map it, develop the innovative technology to explore it, and then reach out to the next generation. Those were our mission requirements. And we were literally, they, this was the orders they were gonna issue the winner of this grant, was the same orders that Thomas Jefferson gave Meriwether Lewis on the Lewis and Clark Act. The object of your mission is to explore for the purpose of commerce, okay? That's what, so a little story. We all remember Napoleon picking a fight with England and losing. And England said, kid, you owe us 21 million. So he goes over to Jefferson and he says, have I got a deal for you? I want to sell you the Louisiana Purchase. We were everything east of the, the colonies were east of the Mississippi. And then he, so naturally Jefferson went to the business sector and they said, why do you want to do that? What was the business sector in 1803? Slave driven tobacco, cotton, raw materials, shipping, the resources to, to, to England. So Jefferson says, well, I, sometimes you don't listen to the business sector. I think it's a good deal. And he went forward and purchased the Louisiana Purchase, and in so doing, doubled the size of the United States. Sent Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea. Now, Sacagawea was the only woman on that expedition. She had been taken Prisoner by the crows up here, she was Shoshone, by the, and by the Blackfeet, captured her, sold her off to a French trapper who became the guide for the expedition. And to make a long story short, as Lewis and Clark ran out of the waters of the Missouri River and had to get out of their canoes, they started over the bitter roots and they get surrounded by a tribe of Indians and normally would have been killed, but the chief of the tribe was her brother. And that's why the Lewis and Clark expedition finished. So don't underestimate that. And she had a baby with her. Don't feel sorry for the guys in the canoe. She's got a baby on top of all of this. So this is why I've named my team, I'll tell you right now. We, well, I'll get to it in a second. I'll do it in sequence. Not a bad deal for 21 million bucks doubling the size of the United States. And with that, the economy shifted dramatically. Look at the massive change of America's economy based upon the Louisiana Purchase. So now flash forward to 1983. For the price of a pen, not 21, President Reagan signs the Law of the Sea Convention and does what Jefferson does, doubles the size of America again. And I call it the New America. It's an article I published in Geographic talking about the New America, the 50% of our nation that lies beneath the sea. And this proposal from NOAA was to mount fundamentally the next Lewis and Clark expedition. But since 55% of our core, Lewis and Clark was the core of discovery, we're the core of exploration, 55% of our core are women in positions of leadership and authority. So we call it the Lois and Clark Expedition. <laughs> and to compete and win, I put together this consortium of institutions, Rhode Island, Trust, Woods Hole, University of New Hampshire, and University of Southern Mississippi. And in our proposal, we talked about building facilities to be able to support that program, which was pivotal in us winning that. And that included the bond, that we got from the state that y'all, the second time you voted, thanks again, keep voting, guys. It's gonna bring great benefits, and that is leading to the present master plan, and also the acquisition of a new ship to be able to be helpful in this exploration program. Labs to develop this new um, vehicle systems and sensors. And in our case, in the Nautilus, because we're waiting for that, I don't know what the due date now of the ship. When do you think, 2024? Mid-2023. Mid-2023, mid-2024, to come off. 
in, into the battlefield. In the meantime, we're focusing with the Nautilus in the Pacific. And this is, so this is the holdings of America in the Pacific, and this is the Papahana Umuakea, where the ship is here right now. And it's out there mapping this very second. This is Guam, and this is down in the American Samoa. So that's our charge, is to map and characterize that part. And so our base is in, uh, for the ship is in San Pedro. This is a new education facility we're building there for the local community. Uh, for workforce development, because all of those people that used to be uh, stevedores in San Pedro and were pushed out by containerization is looking at that workforce to mobilize it. Again, using this exploratory technology, but we were then charged to expand our exploration footprint beyond use of ROVs. And that's where we're headed right now. I just got off the ship after a fascinating cruise where we began to change the game to not only put ROVs in the water, but we've learned in oceanography, if you put two cables in the water, you tie a knot. So we don't put two cables in the water, but now with the use of autonomous vehicles, we can expand our exploration footprint. And we're even working with the University of New Hampshire, a new uh, a boat called Drex, is fundamentally a prototype of an uncrewed ship. The Navy is already putting such uh, the uh, Dartmouth and and the Navy have built a a, a ship a mine a, a submarine hunting ship with no humans on it. So where we're headed is completely humans out of the battlefield. And so this is the, our beginnings. We're the only group of marine researchers in the world that I know of that are beginning this game, not only of moving people ashore, but moving the operators ashore into teleoperations. And this we just did, and then you can watch us again during the month of late part of May, right, when we'll be off. We're going to do this again. I'd love to, Paulo, for you to come over and watch that. It's going to be quite a, but so it's the idea of also studying with autonomous vehicles that literally what we did just a few days ago, we sent out an autonomous vehicle, it went out, did a survey, came back to the ROV through an optical modem, told it what it found, went up the fiber on the satellite out to a team of scientists, very NASA-like, to find a mission, sent it back down, told the ROV, to pro the AUV, to prosecute that discovery. But my favorite little toy was this guy, Mesobot. Mesobot, the largest living space on our planet, is the midwater zone of our planet. Ninety-five percent of all space on Earth that things can live is the midwater areas of the oceans. The most unexplored is the midwater zone. And this little kid is so cute. So here is what we call the twilight zone or the mesopelagic zone. That's how it got its name, where all these creatures are. Now these are creatures that, are, that have to hide from the predators up above. So they hide in what we used to call the deep scattering layer. When we picked that up on our sonars, we thought it was a false bottom. There were so many creatures. And these creatures every night come to the surface when the predators can't see them and feed and then they get out of dodge and go back down in the day. And so this little guy, these are the creatures of the deep scattering layer. These are the ones that inspired me when I looked at National Geographic from Beebe's uh, publications in the 30s and, and, and 40s. Uh, and so this is little Mesobot going down into the deep scattering layer to look at these. It can literally lock on them and follow them without them knowing it. And these are mostly invertebrates. We're also beginning next year adding a whole nother major part to our program. Where we'll be exploring over the next three to five years is where 90% of all the corals, reefs of America are located. And so we're doing a five month a year program. So half, five months doing the Lewis and Clark, Lois and Clark expedition, but then five months working with experts on coral reefs to assess the health and well-being of coral, which you know are under great duress through acidification of the ocean and through global warming. We're, we are, just like COVID, finding new variants that are more heat tolerant. So what we're trying to do, and we're also noticing that corals, even though they're attached to rocks, send off their larvae, that the coral larvae is moving the coral reefs 14 kilometers a year towards both poles. They're getting out of dodge. So how do they do it? Can we find the areas where they don't know? 
and instead of just randomly throwing their larvae, can we actually plant them in places? That's a big part of this program. But clearly my favorite part, which, which uh, Paula just mentioned, is I love kids. I, uh, when I came back from the Titanic, there were 16,000 letters waiting for me. All of them saying, what do I have to do to do what you do, and can I go? And I, I don't know, how many of you participate in the Jason Project? Look at this. I've had 12 million kids go through the Jason Project. Now we're doing it on, on hormones. But my goal is to have every pronoun, every color, every kind of American there is on our core. Because children look for themselves 10, 20 years out. We've had over 1,000 of them sit, go on the Nautilus now. We have a teacher on every watch helping to translate our science. Here's our studio aboard the Nautilus. We want us, that's Megan Cook. And it's, we go to schools all over the United States. We will hopefully do 900 this year that we will have to do one on one because we work 24 hours a day. And we have intern programs of new kids coming up through the system. It's a floating university of mentoring and educating the next generation. That's my daughter. <laughs> By the way, she's graduated. She has a really nice job now. <laughs> but she sailed with me for five years, and they said, Dad, see you, and went off and got a very good job. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and thank you so much. What do you want to do? You... All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, I got a microphone. So uh, if anyone has any questions in the audience, happy to take that. I know we also have some. Um... Yeah, why don't you guys with books come on up, and I can do both. I learned how to chew and walk. Oh, my goodness. OK. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do the Q&A, but let me do the ones that there were about 10 of you. Come on up, and we'll do both. OK, so I did see a first hand pop up over here. Thank you for your talk. A lifetime ago, I was a geologist, but I do a little lobbying for Oceana, and I'd like to know your position on fracking. I mean, if we allow people to do it and say that they're doing it My well. My position on? Fracking, on going in the ocean's crust and getting that ore. I, I think it can, be do, it can be done properly, but like any of these things, they can, do, they can be done poorly. Well, I know that we had 26 companies apply and receive a license to do it, they're, but they're doing it improperly. So I, I don't know how we would be able to say who. Well, let me, let me say a real outrageous thing. First place, we need to do everything we can on every possible way. I'm pro-nuclear. Think about, think about Germany is zero nuclear in their energy and right next door is France, which is 75% of all their energy they do with nuclear power. Wow. And having been in the Navy and been with a great team of nuclear submarine officers, you can do it right. Thank you. Anyone um, else? I've got to go sign some books. So any other questions from the shout audience? Out. I know, okay, here we go. Hi. I can hear you. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ballard. Um, Oops. My question to you was, uh, I was wondering if there was any progress on the preservation, I'm up right here in front, yeah. on the preservation um, underground um, as far as cleaning and preserving, um, I think the Titanic in particular. Uh, I know that you well, the key, the biggest threat that in my 20 years of working in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea and the Aegean was the destruction of history by trawlers, bottom trawlers. They have destroyed outrageous amounts of human history. And what I did with uh, Turkey was we put in tank traps from World War II. Remember tank traps where you basically just take uh, like a, 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 a jack. You put metal together into, and you put them around the shipwreck. As soon as the trawler loses their rig, they don't go there. 
So you can literally put tank traps around them, and, and that discourages them from fishing in that area. So yeah, there's ways of preserving those. And you can also put sentries there, vehicles, that will surface and sound the alarm. Uh, that can be triggered. They can live on the wreck, and they can then uh, be triggered to go to the surface and let people know that someone is there. But also now, most ships are required to have tracking so you know if they come to that spot, and uh, you can, you can, you can, it's, it's really the will of the country because almost all these ancient shipwrecks are in someone's EEC. Very, very few are in the high seas. So it depends upon the, the attitude of the countries on how important it is to them. I know Turkey, Greece, and other countries are extremely rigid on it. Others are not. I just remember in particular there was some kind of a machine that would clean and preserve that would attach. Well, what I, you know, what I must say when I uh, came down on the Titanic, uh, the, the year after we found it, I came down on Alvin, and we came in on the side of the ship, on the starboard side, about a beam of the bridge, and we, it was sitting on its bilge keel. It wasn't in the bottom, and the, the bow was, went into the bottom, and then it broke and then made that hinge motion. But the ship itself was flat bottom, and it was literally sitting on the bottom. And the first thing I saw was pink paint, not a, any rust, because they painted it with anti-fouling paint, and 80-some years old, is still working. Now, naturally, when they were doing the tit building the Titanic, they said, well, just in case it sinks, why don't we paint the whole ship with, with this? But I'm convinced that I don't know if you look at those swimming pool cleaners where you put a little guy in and goes roto rootering around. They do that now on ships because some of the super tankers are so big they can't dry dock them. So they actually go in and they put a magnetic clamps on and just goes like that and it cleans it. And they've now developed an epoxy anti-fouling paint they can apply underwater. Crazy. So I've always said, well, let's go give, go clean the Titanic and paint it. Sounds crazy? Everything I say sounds crazy. <laughs> Get used to it. Dr. Ballard, first of all, as a father of a dyslexic kid, I thank you very much for raising the uh, awareness of that disease. Now, I wonder if you have two or three words on, uh, on the plastic island on the Pacific? Well, we're doing, uh, as you know, uh, uh, our senator, uh, who's an amazing senator, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, is setting up a marine debris foundation and we just met with the Fish and Wildlife. We're going to be working, uh, starting in June, we're going to be working off all the islands, uninhabited islands, from, uh, uh, from Kauai all the way to the inhabited island of Midway, French Frigate Shoals, and, and, and uh, many other islands where marine debris is a, is a big issue. And uh, we're going to be going ashore with parties because we're going to be there for over 100 and some days. And so we're going to mount a pretty major marine debris recovery. If you want to see something truly sad, is you want to go and look at the chicks. Go on your phone and just take, type plastics and chicks on Midway. And you'll, there's a quarter million nesting albatross on Midway Island and the Associated Islands. And their parents go out to feed. And they pick up what they think is a squid, which is a Bic lighter. And they come back, and they can regurgitate it because they're an adult. They put it in the chick, and it can't pass through the chick. And you'll see all of these desiccated bodies of, of chicks totally full of plastic. Yeah, stop using plastic. You know, it's that simple. In fact, they're now recommending you don't eat sea salt because of the microplastics in it. And I went, you got to be kidding. Yeah. There is so much, plastic is so pervasive in the system now. But yeah, plastic is a bad dude. And if you don't, I mean, look at you know, who saw the, ad, the program the other night on Coca-Cola's problem with the, one of the biggest producers of plastic is Coca-Cola. And they made a pledge that they're going to recycle it, and they're not even remotely close to it. So yeah, don't use plastic. You know, or go to the store with your own bags. My car is full of bags, and bring it home. 
but there's so many things you can do. But uh, anyway, yes, plastics are bad. And they're in the big gyres. There's five gyres in the ocean caused by the spin of the Earth. And you get what's called the Coriolis effect. In the northern hemisphere, you get clockwise rotation. First detected by, who was the first to propose? Where's David? Who was the first person to propose the existence of the Gulf Stream? Ben Franklin. And that was not a planet question. <laughs> you know why? He was postmaster general. And he says, why are the ships going to England getting there faster than the ones coming back? And why are the ones ducking down near the Canaries beat those? He says, there must be a circular current out there. Amazing guy. So there's a northern gyre in the Atlantic, a northern one in the Pacific, one in the southern, in the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and then you only have the southern system in the Indian Ocean, so you have that fifth one. And if you, uh, as you know, it's clockwise. If you flush your toilet in the northern hemisphere, it goes clockwise. If you flush your toilet in the southern hemisphere, it goes counterclockwise. And that's a little bit of science. But anyway, what it does then is it, it, it concentrates, which is the good news. It is concentrating them in what we call the garbage patches. But the attempt is how to, you know, the key is don't put it there in the first place. But so, yeah, it's an issue. We have, we have a lot of issues to deal with, that's for sure. Yes? Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. I know you talked about um, close the conventional sea. I know that the United States is not a, is not a signatory yes. on that. There are six senators that are continuing to oppose the signing of it, although other countries de facto are recognizing it. But it doesn't let us do something very important. In the Law of the Sea Convention, if you are a signator of the Law of the Sea Convention, and you can prove that your continental shelf exceeds 200 nautical miles, you can claim that as your land. Other, the signatures have been able to, because we're not signatures, we're not able to claim land that it would be rightfully ours. So it's just crazy. Well, you got to remember how many have one. Yeah. You know, you have to have a coastline. What's the, what is the second or third largest owner of underwater land? Kiribati. Look that one up. <laughs> Kiribati. You got millions of little rocks, and they're, they used to call the Phoenix Islands. Yeah, I want to switch to a couple um, online questions that we're getting. So one is deep sea exploration has been used as an analog of potential hydrothermal systems on extraterrestrial ocean worlds. What is the progress in this field and do you find it fruitful? What's the progress of that program? Uh, what's called, uh, uh, what's it called, ocean worlds, right? And that's Kevin, Kevin Hand at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. And it's a major program. What they're focusing on is Enceladus and Europa. And what they found in the case of Enceladus, they're seeing geysers. So you have to understand, in the first place, we got a, a moon that's totally covered in water, has an ice canopy, so it's think the North Pole in the old days. <laughs> and so it's got an ice canopy, and the thickness of that ice, we're, we're not exactly, something like two miles of ice canopy. But it's moving, and they've been able to see one of the first uh, realizations was it didn't have the right number of craters on it that are caused by other planets that are hit by craters through the early, particularly during the early evolution of the solar system. And it, it looked too clean, and then they realized the ice is turning over and regenerating, and it's moving. Sort of a, a way, I guess, a, a, a version of plate tectonics, but ice tectonics or whatever. And so, the, but then they found that geysers are c coming out of en en Enceladus. And so the idea is, can you fly through those geysers with a satellite with your mouth open and see if you can pick up a, in a wild dream, bacterium, or certainly sulfide-based minerals or whatever. So they do have a, a shot planned. I don't know exactly when it is. Well, uh, yeah, so, to the, so Bob is turning to me because I used to work at NASA. The program's actually run by a GSO grad, Mary Wojtek, at NASA headquarters. 
So, um, uh, yeah, so the idea is to um, start looking for research that uh, looks for sort of benthic or extreme environment living on other planets, and they funded quite a decent portfolio on that so far. Um, so uh, the idea is to expand it uh, to oceans across the solar system from oceans just in um, certain worlds. And the yeah. same with, your, in the case of Europa, they want to send it where they can land on the ice canopy, do a hot penny, but you're not allowed to take nuclear energy into outer space, but a hot penny may be some other form of making a hot, if you put a hot penny on, on ice, it does the work for you. And then would burn through the ice canopy and then release an autonomous vehicle. We now can smell them. We have sensor systems where you can smell uh, vents and home in on them. So the idea is to smell them, home in on them, and see if they have life. So it's a, I think it's a 20, 25 launch, I'm not sure whether where we are with you, the Europa launch, but you can find it online. Dr. Ballad, I was very excited at the end of your presentation to see the slide on the coral reefs and research in that area, um, as you mentioned, and I've had the opportunity, we have the opportunity to see some of the devastation that's taken place, the Great Barrier Reef and the, the loss of coral, and we know it's really important to the whole planet, not just to the coral itself and the species that live with it. Right. So as you're looking at the kind of research and mapping, would the idea be to, re to be able to bring back to life those that are, that are dying or to move them to well, other I think, places I, or both? You know, like, or, I'm just curious. Like any science, first you get the research, then you come up with the ideas to, uh, <laughs> to apply to it. But, Fundamentally, what we're we're working with a really neat guy, Ved. How do you say Ved's last name? Shariah. Say it again. <laughs> Ved is an amazing guy. He just left NASA. He's now at University of Miami Rosenthal. He's developed a amazing imaging system called a fluid lens. Because when water passes over the coral reefs, you have it's it's like this, and it distorts and contracts and distorts. He's developed an ability to make that go away and be able to actually digitize the coral reefs with drones. Then Larry's program, our buddy up at the University of New Hampshire with the Drex can go in and then make a very precise bathymetric, very high resolution, and then we can, what we call sensor fusion, we can put those two together and give you a three-dimensional picture of the coral reefs. What he's been doing, which is interesting because I've just never put much faith in it, but he has, in crowdsourcing, releasing the data to people around the world to say, would you help us identify the different creatures? And uh, he swears that it's, it's very, very accurate. And so what we'll be doing is crowdsourcing, and then we'll be using divers to ground truth it. And that program gets underway in June of next year. Uh, and Papahana Umokuakea, if you can say that, say it. So anyway, I think we're, I'm giving the signal that we're wrapping it up, and I want to thank everyone for having us here tonight, and go Rhode Island.